so it came together. Uh, as soon as I found that out, I'm like, all right, boom, I'm still working with my Katsu version one, which is great. And I love it. You feel me? Um, but I saw the V2. I didn't do it, but I love the compactness of the V2 um, when I've been able to use it with my teammates. And then, boom, you guys just dropped the V3. I'm like, well, look, dude, my itinerary right now was looking like this week I'm going to Brazil. I'll be in Brazil for a whole week. I'll come back. I'll be in Los Angeles for half a week. And then I'll be flying out again to go to trials and compete peak performance for another, you know, 10 to 14 days in Minneapolis. So, you know, we're talking about times. I forget now the time zone in Brazil, but, you know, we're talking about like, I think a four hour difference for like four hour, four or five hours ahead or five hours back. And then two hours, two, two hours ahead, two hours back, you know, so but all in a short amount of time, right? And we're also obviously taking into consideration the dehydration of being on a plane for 16 plus hours right at a time. Uh, or 16 is dramatic. That's the Tokyo. 10 plus hours at a time. You know what I'm saying? 10 hours at a time. So I'm like, all right, time to upgrade. I, I, I get my, I got to get my katsu. So boom, see, that's when I called you up, man. Um, and, you know, woman's really quarterback in there. She's like, look, Steve. We know you got these crazy protocols, you know, for jet lag, for the military, for peak performance. You know, you're in with the IPC. We need the best jet lag protocol you can possibly provide. Um, the top of the top notch. I, I need that top line. That's when I got in contact with you, Chris. Man, not only do I need that top line, but I need a little bit of love here. You know, I want that discount code. I want to maximize this experience. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so Steve was able to get that unit to me. And then boom, like I'm just running my cycles through Brazil, running my cycles in Brazil, you know, back on the plane, running my cycles here at home, uh, always training with my Katsu bands. You know, we do USRPT sets. I have them set at 350 static. Um, so just feeling that burn, fall in love with that pain. Uh, and then, you know, again, bringing it back into Minneapolis, um, using it to wind down after all my race, you know, putting my feet up on the wall laying on a grounding mat and running through that cycle time and time again, just to keep my body fresh, my legs fresh, my blood circulating. And I mean, you know, uh, the results don't always speak for themselves, but the results speak for themselves here, you know? So it's like after a crazy hectic travel schedule, which, you know, to, I think on the, quite frankly, to a lesser athlete or, or someone with less focus easily could have took them out of their game, could, could have, could, could have not made the best, but, but thankfully just the mindset and, the tools that I had available to me, uh, uh, my mind, my body, my spirit were all able to kind of come together in that perfect harmony. So there we go, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. But, you know, we got classified in Brazil and that made me eligible to compete all the way through through the Paralympic trials, prelims and finals and uh, ultimately make this team. So that's where we are now. This athlete spotlight is brought to you by Katsu Global, a convenient, easy to use way to recover faster, rehab stronger, and perform better. Used by summer and winter Olympians worldwide. If you fly into LAX and head out of the International Airport to any point in Southern California, you may just see a large multi-story likeness of Paralympic swimmer Jamal Hill, a native of Southern California who grew up in Inglewood. Jamal Hill was only 10 years old when his body started to fail him. He experienced total paralysis and doctors considered amputating his right arm. The decision was made to keep his arm, but he was diagnosed with CMT, a hereditary neurological condition that can result in progressive loss of muscle tissue and touch sensation in the body. CMT threatened to alter his life, including his passion for swimming, where he started near the LAX International Airport. But through sheer will, deep faith, and relentless determination, Hill has not only regained his mobility and strength, 
but he also competed in high school and college and most recently qualified for the Tokyo Paralympic Games. The 26-year-old Los Angeles native is ranked number one in the U.S. Paralympic Sprinter category in the 50-meter freestyle and number three in the world with eyes on a gold medal. Hill talks about his journey. Um, so this Paralympian journey starts <laughs> in Los Angeles County, man, uh, born Cedar sinai Beverly Hills area, grew up in Inglewood, not too far from LAX, probably like my high school years, like I could ride my bike to LAX, the beach right behind LAX in 20 minutes, just straight up the main thoroughfare. So super close to LAX, probably one major city block away from the new Ram Stadium, the Hollywood Okay. Um, park and casino. So Inglewood is kind of going a renaissance right now, you know, and like when I was born in 95, I was catching the tail end of an era, you know, like that was back when Shaq and Kobe were still at the form. Inglewood was just a pop of city, you know, and uh, really kind of the earliest, you know, photographic memories that I have are of mommy and me. And that's kind of, you know, 10 months old. The photos exist there between 10 and 2. And uh, my mom had never learned how to swim. My dad was a basketball player. So He's like, oh, this kid's going to be great at basketball. And uh, my mom was like, oh, all that's great and dandy, but he's definitely going to know how to swim. So <laughs> from day one, I was in the pool, mommy and me. Major shout out, YMCA of Westchester, California. So still kind of in the vicinity of LAX. A lot of the people that I meet that are actually like black or Hispanic in Los Angeles and even a lot of times just in major cities learned how to swim in a YMCA program. Hill was selected for the Team USA Paralympic 50-meter freestyle and as a relay member. But his passion for swimming extends beyond his personal and professional goals for the Tokyo Paralympics. In an attempt to lower the global drowning rate, Hill began Swim Uphill, an initiative to teach one million people to swim through a wholly innovative program supported by a digital swim school platform. Swim Uphill is exploding with success and growth, just as its founder is doing in the swimming world. This special athlete feature presentation was brought to you by Katsu Global. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all of you out there. We are on a Katsu podcast with Olympic coach Chris Morgan and Paralympian Jamal Hill, my friend and, and inspiration. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. Thank again. you. Good morning. Yeah. And uh, today we're going to talk about Jamal's journey, literally from a pool in Southern California to the uh, Tokyo Olympic pool that he'll be in on what's the date that you're going to uh, uh I believe I'm scheduled to compete the 27th the 27th the 28th of August got it and what events are you entered in I'm 100% entered into 50 meter freestyle uh gonna be a blast a lot of opportunity there and then uh, we're still deciding internally if the men are gonna put on a four by 100 for the medley or the freestyle so it's to be decided, but uh, I, I punched my ticket in that 50 free. Great, great, great. So, so tell us where you were born and, and uh, you know, your early years in the aquatic community. Absolutely, man. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so as you said, it's official. I'm a Paralympian now, you know. <laughs> yeah, man, there we go. I'm a Paralympian now. Um, so this Paralympian journey starts <laughs> in Los Angeles County, man, uh, born Cedar sinai uh, Beverly Hills area, grew up in Inglewood, not too far from LAX, probably like, you know, in my, in my high school years, like I could ride my bike to LAX, the beach right behind LAX in 20 minutes, just straight up the main thoroughfare. So Super close to LAX, uh, probably one major city block away from the new Ram Stadium, the Hollywood okay. um, Park and Casino. So, you know, uh, uh, Inglewood is kind of going through a, a renaissance right now, you know, and like when I was born in 95, I was catching the tail end of an era, you know, like that was back when Shaq and Kobe were still at the forum. Um, Inglewood was just a popping city, you know, my, my dad 
big Lakers fan, basketball fan, you know, very vague memories, but like going to the form, you know, the popcorn, being in the stadium, you know, again, just being able to see Shaq and Kobe in a place that, you know, people only before born before me have ever experienced, right? And probably will ever experience. So that's where I'm from. That's the energy that raised me. Um, I pretty much always went to like charter schools or Catholic schools or private schools throughout my youth. Uh, education was not was is big in our family, you know, um, doing well in school was never an option. Paying attention, getting good grades, you know, uh, my parents, very reliable, man. They, they put in a lot of work. You know, my mom worked as a sheriff. My dad worked for the city. He worked for DWP, a few different entities. So, you know, just like really stable jobs, like really what I would just call, you know, if you can be in middle America, you know, or, or even that lower end of middle America, you know, how, how the gap goes. But uh, that's pretty much where I came up in. Um, only child to older parents, stable jobs had long lives before me. So, when I came into the picture, they were pretty much ready for it, you know, like <laughs> they were like, nice, we got a son, especially my mom. So um, I got I got to ask a question. Yeah. When you were born, did you come out with a big smile on your face? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I don't I don't know. I guess we'll have to write that story. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, but definitely as a kid, you know, like most kids, man, who, who don't have a care in the world. Dude, I was having a good time. I was able to be a kid. As an only kid, uh, you know, you hear so much or I hear so much, right? The only kids wanted to have siblings and the siblings wanted to be an only child. So um, I definitely say I fell on the, the more loving side of the only child spectrum. You know, I was always happy to share. I always felt like I had more than enough, you know, like the here. Well, what do you want? This is mine. No, this is ours now. You're my brother. You're my sister. Like, you know, so that was always me just happy to share. And uh, really kind of the earliest, you know, photographic memories that I have are of mommy and me. Um, and that's kind of, you know, 10 months old. The photos exist there between 10 and 2. And uh, my mom had never learned how to swim. My dad was a basketball player. So he's like, oh, this kid's going to be great at basketball. And uh, my mom was like, oh, all that's great and dandy, but he's definitely going to know how to swim. So <laughs> from day one, I was in the pool, mommy and me. Uh, what, what, excuse me, what pool yeah. was that? That was old. That was great. Yo, major shout out. YMCA. Oh, okay. YMCA of Westchester. Uh, Westchester, California. So still kind of in the vicinity of LAX. Um, right. YMCA has done, you know, obviously amazing program and an amazing work over the years. A lot of the people that I meet that are actually like black or Hispanic in Los Angeles and even a lot of times just in major cities learned how to swim in a YMCA program. So it's no doubt that they're having, you know, impact that that they're a great resource for communities um but yeah learned how to swim man and i think it was just kind of one of those i was in swim lessons in swim lessons and one day i'm looking across the swim lesson pool and i see all the swim team kids hopping in and, and doing whatever they're doing right just being professionals you know to my young mind and i'm like mom i want to be over there with them and at this point, I'm just like, a, you know, I'm a kid, man. I'm a boy. I'm energetic. I don't want to listen. I want to do my own thing. She's like, dude, if you want to be on the swim team, you got to get your act together. I don't need to ever hear the teacher calling your name. Like, you're always trying to kick the water out of the pool and, 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 and swallow it and do this and do that. You can't do none of that no more. You got to focus. And so uh, that was the deal. So I got my act together. You know, it's really easy to... It's really easy to kind of do something when you have a focus, right? When, when there's a concentration, you have some incentive there. So I got mindful about swim lessons and boom, I think within six to 12 months, I was on the swim team. And, and so I'm on the swim team from seven to 10, dude. I just, I loved it. First passion was good at it. I was winning. So that obviously just continues to encourage, you know, anyone, but especially a young boy. So uh, that's how I got into swimming. Those are really kind of the early days coming up in Inglewood around aquatics. Got it. And were, were, were you a, a, a drop-dead sprinter from the get-go? Were you an IMer, distance swimmer? Yeah, believe it or not, in the early day, breaststroke was my best stroke. I was a real good breaststroker. Um, and it was tough because, like, I would, I would sometimes be, like, the second or third best breaststroker, uh, especially just around L.A. County with other, with other teams. Um, so, I mean, no one ever liked Susan, but just, I remember always just super competitive, you know, um, almost to the point of being annoying. I think when I was a kid, I would, I would go up to the table that swim meets like, 
you know, like, where are my medals at? <laughs> you know, it's probably funny once, but like on the second time, it, it doesn't, it's not quite as cute, right? So <laughs> um, that was me, man. And, you know, I, I still remember, like, I have some of the, it's amazing how we hold on to trophies, right? Like, I still have some trophies from age group that were like, oh, high point um, or, you know, most valuable swimming out of the conference. So, and that day I was swimming at all, like butterfly, breaststroke, freestyle, backstroke. I mean, my technique and form were probably nothing to marvel at. They just happened to be better than a lot of kids at that time, right? We probably based that off of athleticism more than actual technical prowess. Uh, so that, that's that's the short answer there. Yeah, that's the short then, answer. I was doing it all. Got it. And then so dial forward to your high school and yeah. college years. Oh, for sure. So we turned that out all the way for us. And now we're coming from, you know, kid out of Inglewood, not a care in the world, uh, you know, as connected with his body as a 10 year old can probably be expected to be, you know, like no real challenges in that capacity. And we dial it forward now into my high school career. And now we're with, you know, an adolescent Jamal, you know, a teenage Jamal um, who's been living with a neuropathy for what, maybe like the past Four to, for four to five years, you know, uh, being 14, 15, 16 around now, having been diagnosed with neuropathy at 10 years old, um, living in, in, in a bit of a the, mind, the mental space of, of being hidden, you know, uh, of not allowing that disability to be known, um, both fortunately and unfortunately, the neuropathy I have kind of is categorized as an invisible disability. So most people looking at me would never know that, you know, I have 0% nerve capacity beneath my knees and it feels like I'm walking on my knees at all times. They really? wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, no, they wouldn't know. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Swimmer, and you mm -hmm. got to get up on the starting blocks. Yeah. Yes, sir. What happens at that point? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, practice kicks in yeah. <laughs> practice. Definitely. Um, I take my time getting up there. I think that's one thing that just comes as you grow in the sport of swimming. When you get up on the blocks, like you start to realize it's your show. You know, like there is no rushing you at this point. Like I'm not going to jump up on this block and hurt myself or be rousing and frazzled because the initial set, the, the official says you can take your mark. Right. So I'm um, just making sure that I really plant my leg. Uh, and, and from a point of physics, it's really just a matter of leverage. Right. So let's just imagine that, from my knee to the soles of my feet are prosthetics that are just permanently attached to my body, okay. right? So like the same um, mechanics that you would consider someone watching them with prosthetics, right? Obviously, you always want to keep the most of your weight over a center point, right? So I want to have my kneecap and the center of my foot aligned, right? They want to be parallel, parallel points at all times. And from that way, I can use it as leverage to propel and, you know, apply force to through that knee. So when I'm stepping up onto the blocks, just making sure that like my 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 bones and joints are stacked, you know, especially in the lower body. And then uh, when I'm on the block, I use uh, almost like a signature dive. A sig not almost. It is a signature dive. It's not your standard dive where both hands are forward and a track start. Um, it's like a three point stance track start where I use one hand that is not on the block. My three point means both feet are down and one hand is down. Okay. I use one hand that's not on the block. Um, I call it, uh, I call it the pistol start. Cause it's like sitting on my hip, like a, like a pistol in a Western movie. Got it. And when the, you know, uh, start person says go, I would like almost like kind of, pump action that hand and that arm and it generates momentum for my whole body to move forward because in that position I'm not able to generate any propulsion from my feet from my ankles from my calves um and obviously with my quads and glutes at that point being parallel to the platform as opposed to perpendicular you know again it, it doesn't just it doesn't provide the most opportunity for forward uh for forward propulsion so uh that's something that I use in that space that um Hey man, it's been working for me. We'll continue to fine tune it, and it's way better than what it looked like before. I'll tell you that much. So I know we've been all over the place here. But where should I jump back in at? Oh no, no, that that I I actually love this conversation on how you took your disability yes, based sir. on your neuropathy, and you actually discovered the best way to go forward. 
What, was that a long process? I mean, you know, practice, 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 experiment. What, how did you come across this three-point pistol stance? Absolutely, man. It's been a long process. Got a shout out uh, David Weck and the Weck Method, Weck Method Family and Systems down in, uh, down in San Diego. Um, we first kind of started experimenting with just like la la lateral locomotion, like driving the motion from the lats of the body. Um, and, you know, taking inventory again of the Paralympics, I like to say I work with some of the most inspirational people that there are, right? You, you can learn the most from these people. I'm talking about individuals with no arms and no legs that swim not only better, but faster than, than people I know who have <laughs> every opinion there are. Some people who have extra, you know, <laughs> and they're swimming better than them. Um, so just understanding that so like oh, within a certain level of of within a certain level of our perception of what's normal comes a privilege that that like uh, that almost like makes us a disadvantage right like we think we need certain things or we put our primary focus on things that are actually maybe secondary or only tertiary and in my case and i think a lot of the case of athletes with the paralympics you are forced to reduce it back down to the most common denominator. As a human being, whether I have no legs, legs, um, use of my legs, fingers or not, there's going to be a primary lever. And that primary lever is ultimately going to be in the torso, right? It's going to be the torso that is the primary lever. Um, and that's where all the motion is driven from. Your arms, your hands, your feet, your legs, all those are secondary levers. Uh, so they really are just functions of the primary lever, right? It all has to be generated here and then it transmutes outward, right? Um, so just kind of drilling back down and like thinking again, okay, how do we activate what we 100% do have access to our disposal? I have a very strong core. Um, my glutes are getting stronger, you know, but, but a really strong core, uh, a really solid base as far as neuropathy goes. You know, my, my neuropathy doesn't affect me in my base. So how can we best leverage this base? Um, and, you know, I think everyone, all the greats do this. You know, it, it doesn't matter. You're always learning. Um, and so in our lessons, in our learning, uh, we just started to figure out, well, look, if we can't generate propulsion from the lower legs, uh, in what way, you know, can we activate the core and get me at least enough lift, you know, to have a nice body line um, with um, almost like cheating, almost like cheating energy systems. And I know I'm, I'm kind of going in circles here. It's slightly, it's not complex, you know, but it's, it's, it's slightly more than simple. Um, really, it was just long story short. It was like, OK, look, we need to generate some free energy to get Jamal off this blocks and make it look like he can jump. Um, we can't, we have to have one hand down for balance. We have to have both feet down. He can't do this standing up and run and jump type thing. It's going to take too much time. So that gives us one arm to work with one arm and pretty much the trunk to try and manipulate with it. So how can we swing this arm in order to generate enough free energy that it's almost like someone is pulling this arm across the pool and his body follows it um that was the thought behind it that was the mindset behind it we've done a lot of practices i still have ten thousand more practices to do with this dive it is it's it's successful for the stage it's in but it is still in a very early stage so uh there we go <laughs> the pistol dive <laughs> got it so um hey chris you had a question yeah um jamal uh, can you guys hear me i'm sorry yes sir great um you know uh, jamal one of probably the most inspirational um moments in my career was uh, in 2015 I was working with Leanne Smith who's a para swimmer mm -hmm. I, I believe she's an SP award right now yeah she's a an S3 I think now yes sir and I, I was down in Miami at one of the meets um already eyes wide open just watching uh people and 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 the the camaraderie of, of all the athletes and like you said people that uh, missing arms and missing legs. And I was waiting for Leanne's heat of the 50 freestyle. And this woman walked up to me. She didn't have a coach. And she said, coach, can you help me? And I said, sure, what do you need? And she looked down at her prosthetic leg. She took it off and she said, can you run this down to the other side for me? And I said, you bet. 
And um, so I thought, okay. And, and she got up on the block by herself uh, with one leg. And not only did I need to, I had to sprint to get her leg down to the other side and handed it to her. She smiled and said, thank you. And for me, it was, I even get chills thinking about it now. It was so inspirational and, and so, you know, you'd think that would be an awkward moment, right? Someone says, take my leg to the other side. And it was not awkward. It was motivational and um, wow. So it was a kind of a wow moment for me. But uh, so I wanted to thank you, Jamal, just for everything you do to inspire <laughs> us um, who, you know, I kind of felt when I was at that competition, you know, I, I was the, um, the person who was different, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was a really neat thing to, to say that I, I was not, 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 not the, the person and, and you can understand that. So just for our listeners, you know, could you explain to us, Kind of your, what 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 exactly your the, the disease and and yes, and even the name of it just for us to be a little bit educated. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I was saying real quick with Leanne, I wasn't saying S three award. I was saying an SB award. Yeah, yeah no, of the year SB. You know, and I'll SB tell you when I used to. T she, uh, you know, before her, um, uh, before she was. Um, diagnosed with with her disease um dystonia right is what she has she um she was a gymnast and boy she she would get off the block she would get up out of her wheelchair sit on the blocks probably the fastest most explosive start i ever saw wow. from leanne yeah wow, wow. <laughs> that, that's incredible man uh well absolutely chris thank you thank you for taking that leg to the other end uh that's definitely one great thing i think about the paralympic circuit is that, you know, I haven't have been, and trust me, I'm going to circle back this around the charcoal on my tooth, but having been, you know, to, to tier pro series, to having been to, you know, I just, uh, I, don't, I don't, I've never been to nationals, but like having been to sectionals and things like that, having been just a part of the mainstream swimming experience, right, of, of able-bodied athletes, and then being in the mainstream of, you know, uh, the Paralympic realm of athletes and swimming, there's just completely different energies. It's like, obviously, all of these people are peak performers. All of these people are the best in the world. Um, nothing to be trifled with. But it's something about this Paralympic space that just has a little bit more gratitude and, and openness. You know, like, if you're here, then you're a coach and I need something. I'm just going to talk to you. If, you. if you're here and you're an athlete, it's like, yeah, obviously we're competing and like everybody wants to win, but it's not this, it's almost, there's not this dog eat dog energy about it. You know, there's all, there's this like, man, I'm just here to eat, you know, like, well, whatever that looks like for me today, I'm at peace with that, you know? So, so there's a lot more acceptance and I, Obviously, it's probably tied into the experiences these people have had in their lives to get them to this point. Um, but I think it's amazing because I, I really just kind of feel it shine through in the energy of those meets. Uh, with that said, you know, we keep talking about, obviously, uh, people with disability and, and, and missing legs. And I think that's interesting because as someone with Charcot Marie Tooth um, and that being more of an invisible disability for a long time, that was a big challenge to me coming out about my disability because I don't fit this stigma of what disability is, right? Like, I don't fit this image that we all have of like, that person, I know for sure I can put them in a box and I can label them, right? Um, oh, he, well, you're not wheelchair bound, Jamal. Well, I don't see any like, there's nothing wrong with this kid, you know? Um, and, or even, even for blind athletes a lot of times, you know? And that's not to, you know, obviously, take from or, or add to anyone's circumstances just to say that, you know, when we're talking about lives and people and human experiences, it's not black and white. Everything is in the shade of gray. Everything, it, you know, is so expansive and so inclusive. So again, just like me speaking with the shark and Marie tooth community, um, specifically what it is, the type of disease, it's neuropathy, uh, most often hereditary. Um, I had a delayed onset. It affected me at 10 years old. When it's completely inflamed, I can go into a state of full body paralysis, um, which I've been a couple points in my life. And during those times, you know, I don't, I don't mean to just sweep it under the rug here, but 
I just kind of hang out and smile and, and wait for my body to kind of turn back on, you know, uh, because especially when we talk about peak performance, I saw something on IG the other day and it was like somebody was saying, oh, they say peak performance is 20 percent physical and 80 percent mental. And somebody was like, well, whether that's true or not, it's 100 percent neurological, like it's 100 percent neurological. Um, and so, you know, again, just kind of to keep it in layman's terms, someone dealing with a neuropathy, whether that be uh, cerebral palsy or, or, or I think even uh, there's some overlap with what Leanne experiences in her condition or, or Charcot-Marie Tooth, um, ultimately what you experience is your body parts, your limbs, the things that, you know, are still attached to you, they begin to decay, you begin to lose function of them and the ability to grow them because the signals that communicate between the mainframe computer and the action parts, the, the signal is frayed, the signal is distorted, the signal doesn't get through somehow. So you're not able to wiggle your toes. You're not able to do a calf raise. Um, you're not able to, to, to hold on to a, a glass of water as well as you think you can hold on to it, you know? So I keep plastic cups around me. Um, but <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's really in the most simple terms, you know, uh, just kind of what I experienced and, you know, again, just kind of a broad stroke of, I think what a lot of people with neuropathy and, and different forms of invisible disabilities experience. And, and, uh, it's, uh, I'll add this cause it's an interesting, it's an interesting subculture and subtexture here. Like in everyday world, you would think the, now nah, you would think it's a, it's a fact. In everyday world, as far as the disability community is concerned, in some ways, I definitely have a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of privilege, right? Because I can blend in, right? Like, especially if I throw on a pair of pants, and you know what I'm saying, like, and you can't see how skinny my legs are, I blend in. You would never know. But when I'm on the Paralympic scene, um, especially when we talk about things like being classified. And, uh, and, and somebody really, it's being their job to acknowledge my disability and my challenges. I'm on the opposite end. <clears throat> now I've gone from a position of privilege to a position of in some ways like lack of privilege, right? Because now obviously we have tests and results that show data, but we're still dealing with human beings and their perception. You know? So like the same way someone with no knowledge could perceive me, nothing is wrong. Even someone with a lot of knowledge you know, it's still met with certain things from the eyes. We're all still constantly being challenged. Like me or my teammate or this person is not that person, you know, who, who was able to, who, who sacrificed an arm in military service to save a unit, right? And it's very clear cut where we're going to place them in this system. Um, so a lot of nuances, uh, a lot up and down, you know, I wish, I wish it was just super simple, you know, <laughs> but hey, if it was super simple, right, everybody would be doing it. We would all probably, we'd all probably uh, be doing something else, actually. So there we go, Chris. I hope I was able to get to the heart of something there. Oh, no, that's great. That's, that's, um, and, and now, um, if I could, Steve, you know, Jamal, it's, it's, you know, every little kid who's an athlete, their dream to go to the Olympics. And, um, I remember, you know, I missed my opportunity as, as, as an athlete, but it's what inspired me to get there as a coach. And it wasn't easy as well to do that as a coach. But I remember the day I was told I would be the Olympic coach. You know, I'm sure um, I'd just love to know how you felt, you know, a couple of days ago, right? When you, <laughs> when you, when, when you, you know, it's, uh, can you just tell us your emotions and your feelings when you, you knew it had come to fruition? Yeah, man. Um, it still feels pretty surreal, uh, to be honest, you know, like from, so, so with us, we had two parts of trials. We had a trials in, in, in April and a trials just last week. And they were choosing the team based off of these two events. So in reality, based off of my performance in the first event, out of the 10 spots for men, I already knew that like I was pretty much going to be unchallenged for a spot on the team. Like I knew I had pretty much, it wasn't official. Nothing could be announced, nothing to go talking about, but it was like doing the math on how they calculate, you know, what the spots come based off of the world record and things like that. 
the mass that I was making that team. You know, everyone else could have had the best swims of their life and I was going to be one of those 10 spots at that point. Um, so that definitely took off. That took off a lot of pressure. Um, and then coming into Dallas, my whole thing was, you know, not consciously, but, you know, in the back of my mind, it's just like, ultimately, you know, it's like, they st you still got to, you still got to do your thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you don't just rest on your laurels. You don't just see how much, oh, like I'm on this team. The math is done. I don't need to try. I don't need to like, you know, I want to improve for me. So coming into this meet, you know, I, I had some goals, uh, some silent goals that I never told anyone about except for Wilma. Well, we were able to smash those, you know, took home three American records and and uh, really just put on the show that's like, yeah, like, dude, this kid deserves to be representing us. You know what I'm saying? It's not not a matter if he showed out, no, it's like time and again, he's still improving. This is somebody we can count on. This is somebody this team needs. And so to be able to put on that performance in front of my teammates, on the Paralympic trial stage, first time it's ever been televised was, I think it was, I think it was impactful. You know, I think it like, it helped them, you know, really kind of believe more. You know, I do a lot of marketing. So like there's some legend around the Jamal Hill name at this point, especially in the Paralympic space. So it's like, it just was like, it, it added some truth to it, you know, like, okay, like this guy is, is somebody that is deserving these things, you know, like he's really still coming here and performing and being a great teammate. Um, it was super exciting to have heard my family been able to watch these races on TV. Um, you know, <laughs> it's very rare that I get to like have a race and then talk to the people I love about it, you know, because they haven't seen it, you know, there, there's no investment into it, but this being on TV and, and getting the calls after I broke that American record the second time and um, and just kind of being able to recap, like, yeah, man, you know, I had this race. Oh, man, I messed up here and here and here, but I held it together and, and I still did it, you know, and people haven't been able to see that and experience it in the moment um, and just kind of experience the excitement around. And I say me, but it's like really around we, around like what we've been able to put together and just like what I'm the one that's presenting, you know, like, the, the way that I speak on camera, the way the way that we perform, the way that we interact, or the way that the announcers speak about the Swim Uphill Mission and what we're doing, it was all pretty surreal. Um, and now, you know that, again, it hasn't still fully set in yet, but I've been telling people it's like, I hang, I've been hanging out with lawyers like this. Everybody's taking the LSAT, right? So it's like, imagine just taking a midterm or a final exam, you know, and, and it's all short answer or essay questions. You got five essay questions. And let's just say like after the third essay question, mind you, you're spending like 20, 30 an hour on each of these questions. After the third essay question, everybody's blowing up your phone. Like, Hey, how you doing, man? How, how's, how's that test going so far? Like, how was that last question? Did you nail it? Are you excited? Like mission accomplished. Right. And it's like, definitely mission accomplished. Like, I'm grateful that I was able to answer that last question, you know, so presently and experienced it. I'm glad you were able to even get a preview of it, but I'm still in the middle of an exam here, you know, like <laughs> I'm still in the middle of an exam. Um, there's still, you know, future opportunities. There's still a, a future present right now. And so at this point in time, like as crazy as it sounds, man, it feels like the past. You know, like, it just, it feels like the past. Like, it's like, man, like, that was great. I have that memory. It's been recorded. We'll always have that memory. And I imagine the games, as wonderful as they will be, whatever happens from them, after they're over, they'll feel like the past. And and I'll just be, like, in a new present space, you know, still growing, evolving, and things like that. And so, you know, not not to, like, take the the the, the magic away from it or, like, but I think that that's kind of what makes it magical. You know, it's like you wait so long for something, still trying to just be in the present, and then it happens. And in the moment of it happening, you really got to try and enjoy it in that moment because it's like only before and after do you like really feel like, oh man, it's really not here anymore, right? So it just adds that much more value to the present moment. So again, long-winded Jamal Hill, man, but... <laughs> I, I have a, so before you got to Dallas, <laughs> yes, sir. You got you had to go to LAX, Houston, Rio de Janeiro, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my God! And sort of explain that whole journey. Oh, certainly in the last what? Yes, sir. Three weeks, and, and also 
how you use katsu along the way. Oh, guaranteed, man, guaranteed. So coming up, okay, so this is the most important thing for this story is to understand the difference in the Olympics and Paralympics. Olympics, first you get your seed time, you get your OT cut, you go to trials, you swim fast, you swim fast, make it through prelims, semis, finals, boom, final two, you make the team. Paralympics, right, a little bit different. So in the same way that like Team USA earn spots for the Olympic team by doing well throughout the quad, same thing with the Paralympics, right? So our women's team is freaking amazing. They earned 24 spots for women throughout the quad. Or I guess the 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 cent, this the the quint, the kent, right? The five. Uh, our men's team is growing. So we only earned 10 spots for men out of the out of the five years. And so uh, obviously number one is like if you hold a world record or like you're in the top three. That's pretty much how they base off of who's going to make the team in what ranking order, how close you are to that number three spot. Uh, mind you, now I'm number three in the world with, with my latest times out of, out of, uh, out of uh, Minneapolis, right? Neither here nor there. But so that part is the same. We get that. The, the big difference is something called classification, okay? And so to be eligible to compete internationally as a Paralympic athlete, you have to go almost before, like, consider it like a, a national, uh, an international governing board of doctors. These doctors are not U.S. doctors. They could be from Brazil, from Germany, anywhere in the world. But they are trained, essentially, to place you in a specific competing category that based upon the evaluations on land and in water and how they interpret the effects of your disease or condition on performance. <clears throat> we get that. Here we go. First curveball. Last year, 2020, there were, we were underserved in terms of classifiers. And then a new rule in 2020 meant that an entire almost 2,000 new athletes needed to be newly classified in addition to the some thousand of athletes that already had to be classified and weren't. So now we have twice the number of usual, the same amount of classifiers, and a COVID schedule that makes traveling and organizing events extremely, extremely difficult. So with all this said, coming into our initial trials in, in April, Jamal Hill, I had not been internationally classified, which means I was ineligible to compete in an international competition. I was technically ineligible to make the Tokyo team. And I was also ineligible to compete in the finals at that initial trials. So when I went to that initial trials, I swam prelims with my group, with my heat, but at finals, I was swimming pretty much at time trial finals, even with having like, you know, I think I, I know I had the top three seed time in, in, in every event. And one of them, I had top second seed time. I was swimming in a pool by myself doing time trials, you know, still hitting best times because I was ineligible to swim finals. Coming out of that, um, you know, shout out to my coach, shout out to my agent, shout out to my team. We're just like, I'm frustrated because I'm like, listen, unless I get a classification appointment, I can't be named to the Tokyo team. You know, like even if they do classification in Tokyo, if I'm not named to the team, that doesn't benefit me at all. That doesn't, that doesn't matter. Um, you know, I need this to be eligible. And, you know, we're kind of getting the story. Oh, there's no opportunities. Nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Um, and at first I'm frustrated. I'm hot. I'm very angry. I'm upset. I'm like, you know, we're, we need to go run a story at LA Times. We need to like address this. This is freaking injustice. This is unfair. Like, well, I'm not going to go to second trials if I'm not going to have an opportunity to compete at finals. Like pretty much just like F the system, man. Like I I've done all this work for five years and now a doctor's appointment. You guys are going to tell me like you can't figure out a doctor's appointment. We just had so many doctors here in Texas two weeks ago. They were here for a whole week. Nobody could have seen me like I was here. So, so I was frustrated, man. I was angry. I was upset. Uh, a four-time Paralympian at that time was going through a similar situation. He also just made the team Rudy Garcia Tolson. Um, and so we're upset. We're angry, man. Um, and, and I'm calling around and, and I actually call the, the CEO of Challenge Athletes, not Challenge Athletes, at Angel City Sports. Um, and I'm talking with him. His son is on the track and field team. And uh, between him and a few other people, they're just like, look, Jamal, the system is not perfect. 
but you still got to play the game, dude. Like you owe it to yourself to go to trials, even if you don't get to do finals. You know, listen to my parents. They're like, listen, this started out being about nobody but you. So don't let them take away this experience from me. This is still, you know, once in a lifetime, you know, let alone once in five years. This is still once in a lifetime. You should go. You should do it. And so I was just like, all right, you know what? I let it go. I let the energy go. Obviously, still got my agent calling everybody from here to the IPC in Germany, 10 buck to and back. Um, but I let it go. We just doubled down on our training. We're focusing. Uh Man, probably about like four weeks out from Minneapolis, I get a call. Hey, you're going to Brazil next week to get classified. Uh, you know, so out of absolutely nowhere, it turns out it was the Brazilian Paralympic trials. Um, so just so you understand, me and Rudy, and I think there was another athlete from the Philippines there, to be at a Brazilian Paralympic trials, this is pretty unheard of. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, again, you just get it, like, other countries don't show up to other countries, Olympic and Paralympic trials, right? Like that, that's, it's just that simple. That's you get it. Right. So us being there was highly irregular, which means that the pressure that our team, cause Rudy had his team applying pressure from his side, you know, it's so like all the pressure that we're applying, the kind of story that could have come out after all this has happened. Somebody, I think along the way was just like, we got to get these guys classified. Like, they earned that much. We got to figure out. Otherwise, it's going to bite everybody in the ass after the fact. Um, so it came together. Uh, as soon as I found that out, I'm like, all right, boom. I'm still working with my Katsu version one, which is great. And I love it. You feel me? Um, but I saw the V2. I didn't do it. But I love the compactness of the V2 um, when I've been able to use it with my teammates. And then, boom, you guys just dropped the V3. I'm like, well, look, dude. My itinerary right now was looking like this week I'm going to Brazil. I'll be in Brazil for a whole week. I'll come back. I'll be in Los Angeles for half a week. And then I'll be flying out again to go to trials and compete peak performance for another, you know, 10 to 14 days in Minneapolis. So, you know, we're talking about times. I forget now the time zone in Brazil, but, you know, we're talking about like, I think a four hour difference for like four hour, four or five hours ahead four or five hours back and then two hours, two, two hours ahead, two hours back, you know, so, but all in a short amount of time. Right. And we're also obviously taking into consideration the dehydration of being on a plane for 16 plus hours, right. At a time uh, or 16 is dramatic. That's the Tokyo 10 plus hours at a time. You know what I'm saying? 10 hours at a time. So I'm like, all right, Time to upgrade. I I, I get my I got to get my katsu. So boom, see that's when I called you up, man. Um, and you know, woman's really quarterback in there. She's like, look, Steve, we know you got these crazy protocols, you know, for jet lag, for the military, for peak performance. You know, you're in with the IPC. We need the best jet lag protocol you can possibly provide. Um, the top of the top notch. I, I need that top line. That's when I got in contact with you, Chris. Man, not only do I need that top line, but I need a little bit of love here. You know, I want that discount code. I want to maximize this experience. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so Steve was able to get that unit to me. And then, boom, like, I'm just running my cycles through Brazil, running my cycles in Brazil, you know, back on the plane, running my cycles here at home, uh, always training with my Katsu bands. You know, we do USRPT sets. I have them set at 350 static. Um, so just feeling that burn, fall in love with that pain. Uh, and then, you know, again, bringing it back into Minneapolis, um, using it to wind down after all my race, you know, putting my feet up on the wall, laying on a grounding mat and running through that cycle time and time again, just to keep my body fresh, my legs fresh, my blood circulating. And I mean, you know, uh, the results don't always speak for themselves, but the results speak for themselves here, you know? So it's like after a crazy, hectic travel schedule, which, you know, to, I think on the quite frankly, to a lesser athlete or, or someone with less focus, easily could have took them out of their game, could could have could, could have not made the best, but but thankfully, just the mindset and the tools that I had available to me, uh, uh, my mind, my body, my spirit were all able to kind of come together in that perfect harmony. So there we go, man. It's crazy. It's crazy, but you know, we got classified in Brazil, and that made me eligible to compete all the way through through the Paralympic trials, prelims, and finals, and uh, ultimately make this team. So that's where we are now. Just so I understand, you're <laughs> had to before and after you compete. 
Or oh, for sure. I'm I'm using Katsu, and the, and mind you, I'm still. I think I moved past a rookie. Uh, you know, because of what we, what, man, see, we had Katsu since, what, 2018? Yeah. Right? So, like, it's 2021. Uh, we recognize that we're still heavily underutilizing Katsu. Like, we recognize that. And and there's this, I think it's just such an experience, right, all things, like, but this is such an experiential learning curve. You know, like, you work with something, you're not really sure how to maximize it. And you let it go and you come back to it. So it's been evolving. Um, so currently right now, we're using it. I'm using it in, in terms of training. I'm using it intra-training always. Like it's always on during our sets. And then I'm using it definitely outside of, I don't use it usually if I, I'm using it like as recovery, mostly in, in competition periods. Yeah. Like in training periods, it's active, like it's it's on full force in the static zone, locked on. And then in competition periods, I'm using it, you know, after the race. I'm using it, you know, to pump the blood out, to pump it through, in, out, circulated, following the race to get those legs back. Um, and I'm using it, you know, maybe like before bed or something like that. Again, it sounds a little crazy, but just like to wake, I like to wake up my body before I go to bed, you know, like I like to have, all of my joints lubricated and, and the blood flowing, you know, so just doing minor, just minor arm exercise, you know, stretching with my arm bands on, really get that heart pumping uh, before I go to bed. So, yeah, again, we're still heavily underutilized, man. man. Like, I think there's, there's still a, we're still sitting on a gold mine with Katsu and, and our exploration of it. Um, but I would say at this point, we've at least become you know, uh, educated enough to, to say that, to say that we're, we're, we can consistently reproduce certain, certain outcomes with it for sure. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, thank you very much. And then, you know, we've talked about your journey from, you know, mommy and me classes to yeah. where you are now, but I can see that energy and your passion is going to take you a lot further for a lot, many more swim meets and many more Paralympics. Amen to that. I appreciate that, brother Steve. Man, we're just uh, we're all taking it a day at a time, man. We're all yeah. taking it a day at a time, right? Just that present moment. So I appreciate that. You know, all goes well. You'll see us in 2024, 2028, and you know who knows? There might be more. There might be less. But uh, we got this here right now, and uh, we're gonna make the most of it. Enjoy, enjoy. Yes, thank sir. you very much. Thank you, man. Thank you, too, Chris, man. Yes, thank you. It was very interesting. Hill was selected for the Team USA Paralympic 50-meter freestyle and as a relay member. But his passion for swimming extends beyond his personal and professional goals for the Tokyo Paralympics. In an attempt to lower the global drowning rate, Hill began Swim Uphill, an initiative to teach one million people to swim through a wholly innovative program supported by a digital swim school platform. Swim Uphill is exploding with success and growth, just as its founder is doing in the swimming world. This special athlete feature presentation was brought to you by Katsu Global.